John Cena. I ain't scared of you. I'm a computer science teacher. Hey, take your filthy belt. Okay. Hey, my name is Mr. K and welcome to another episode of 5 Minute Computer Science. Today, we're going to carry on our discussion on processor performance. We're going to be looking at clock speeds, cache memory, pipelining, von Neumann architecture, Harvard architecture. And we're going to be looking at all those factors and how they affect the performance of your PC. So let's put five minutes on the clock, boom, and let's make it happen. All right, so let's have a look at performance factors. Now, the performance factors you need to be familiar with are things like clock speed, and number of cores, cache, and other things like pipelining and the different types of architecture. So let's have a look at the first one. Now, the clock speed essentially is the number of cycles that the CPU can uh, process in any one go. So when you buy a processor, you typically find a number that's given to you. So it might say something like 3.4 megahertz if you lived in the 90s or these days, 3.4 gigahertz. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, one hertz essentially is one cycle per second, okay, or one interrupt that's produced by the clock signal. So 3.4 megahertz would be 3.4 million cycles per second. That's 3.4 million fetch execute cycles that can potentially take place. But of course, today we're talking about gigahertz, so we're into the billions rather than millions, which does make our life a little easier. But let's have a quick example to clarify this. Here, we've got a set of five instructions that need to be processed, okay? Or five parts, should I say. Instruction, data, data, result, and save. So these are the five actions that need to be done. And each of those is going to happen per clock cycle. So let's say that each cycle is called a pulse. So a one hertz processor can only produce one pulse per second. So in the first second, this instruction is carried out or executed. In the second pulse, that's the second second, this bit happens and then the next second this happens and so on so it takes five seconds to get through this bit of data here or this action that needs to take place however if you've got over here a 10 hertz processor a 10 hertz processor actually produces 10 pulses in one second so it would only take half a second for five pulses to occur and the instructions and the data and everything else to have been executed so you can see the difference is significant. A one hertz processor will take five seconds to carry out all the execution of the code, whereas a 10 hertz processor will take out half a second. Really, we're talking about millions and billions, so this would take absolutely less than a blink of an eye. Right, let's have a look at the next bit, the cache memory. So the cache memory is really super small, but very fast memory that's located in between the CPU and main memory, that is RAM. Of course, cache memory can be built in as part of the CPU, but typically it sits in between. And you can have different levels of cache. So the cache levels will determine how much data that you can store and how quickly can that be accessed. Now, of course, main memory is quick, but the CPU is far quicker than it takes the time for the data bus to bring the information to the CPU. And so level one, two, and cache level three can be used to bridge the gap between the data bus and the CPU sitting there doing absolutely nothing. Another thing that affects the uh, number of cycles and the amount of data that you can process is the pulse. Now, today, typically, you find processors that are dual core or quad core or even more so. And cores are essentially CPU, uh, they are essentially CPUs, if you'd like to think. And they've got their own control unit, they've got their own ALU, and so on. And they are built into the CPU itself. So it's like doubling up or even more. Now, theoretically, this should mean that data can be processed a lot quicker. And it can, as long as that data isn't related to each other. Okay, so you can see here, each core is responsible for its own memory in terms of control unit and ALU and so on. And therefore, it can get through four times the amount of data compared to a single core processor. So we're going to be looking at this a little bit later on in more detail. And then we've got this idea of pipelining. Now, you might want to pause this video and have a read of this, but pipelining essentially is trying to use each cycle, the fetch execute process, a lot more efficient than how it is at the moment. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that in this next diagram. Pipelining in action here, you'll notice that if we've got a non-pipeline CPU, this is what it does. Um, you see, when the fetch cycle or part of the cycle is being processed, the decode and execute cycles might not be doing much. 
because the uh, the actual pulse has been produced or the cycle might only be responsible for the fetch and then the next one for the decode and the next one for the execute and then the next one for the next part and that means that each although each of those are being done sequentially it takes four times longer than it might if you used pipelining so in pipelining it's a bit different because you'll notice here that whilst the fetch is being done okay that's no problem that's that's pulse one that's gone fetch the data then on pulse two there's the, an, another fetch is taking place as well as a decode the decode and the fetch is taking place at the same time and this means that it's a lot easier to get through lots of data than to wait for each pulse and for that data to be processed at each pulse rather at each pulse the fetch and the decode and the execute can all be going on at the same time it's a bit like if i go back to this you'll if you read through this it's a bit like having a cafe where somebody's pouring in the tea somebody's pouring in the milk somebody's stirring and somebody's serving rather than have one person who does all of those jobs sequentially the other bits you need to be familiar with is how the architectures the modern architectures of today's PCs can affect the processing speed. Well, one of the things that you need to be familiar with is the Von Neumann architecture. The Von Neumann architecture actually has been around for quite a while. And the idea behind this is that you've got the CPU, you've got your memory and your input outputs, but the memory that you're accessing holds both the data and the instructions somewhere in memory. Okay, and this is uh, the idea behind it. It's called stored program computer concept. And essentially, one area of memory or RAM or hard drive, everything's in there, both the address of the instruction and the data. And that's why a lot of work is done on the opcode and the operand to determine what does that data tell you? What do those zeros and ones actually mean? That's okay, but it does have a few problems. All right, and we're going to look at those now. The problem with von Neumann is every piece of data and instruction has to pass across the buses. And the data bus, whilst it's very quick, is still not quick enough to service the CPU. And what that means is the CPU receives the data and then just sits there doing nothing because it's executed the data. It's now waiting for the data bus to fetch the next bit of data and it's sat there idle. And that causes a problem. Okay, so the CPU is finished doing its business. It's just waiting. When will I receive the next bit of data? Well, we can fix that by using a different type of architecture called Harvard. Now, Harvard is more expensive, it is more complicated, but it does solve the problem. And what it does is that it has two separate memory locations, one for the data, one for the program. And it's not possible for you to accidentally write over the program code by saving some memory, uh, saving a file on top of the program. Whereas that might have happened in Von Neumann. In the Harvard architecture, you've got the data separately, the, the program memory separate. So they've got their own buses, and that means that the address bus can be used to fetch data from memory and a separate address bus is used to fetch data from the program and separate buses to take data back 